I'm not actually sure if I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes? Oh, I can see some people I know. <laughs> um, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to speak. I have a confession to start with, uh, and that is that I'm not a clinician. So I'll just say that right up front. Uh, when I finished school, I thought I was going to be an artist, uh, and I didn't know what an en engineer was, so I thought they drove trains. And um, someone said, you really should do medicine. And I said, but I don't really want to be a doctor. I thought I was going to be a zoologist. And, and, and I did science. And in my first year of, of science uh, at University of Queensland, I discovered physiology. And physiology and biochemistry is what I've really done. And that, that's really evolved into, into molecular biology, developmental biology, and ultimately into stem cell biology. I'd really reinforce a lot of the things you just heard. Uh, the, the questions that you really need to ask uh, are the ones you can't even think about now because there's very few things that you can think of that somebody else won't think about, but it's really looking towards uh, you know, the big picture items in the distance. And a lot of what I was taught when I was going through as an undergraduate is now not dogma any longer. Uh, things like uh, you have a certain number of neurons and during your life you're going to just have them all die. We actually now know that there are stem cells in the brain that are actually turning over neurons. Things like a cell becomes a cell type and that's the end of the story is, is now completely uh, not dogma. We actually now know that you can reprogram a cell into a completely different state. And so what you're being taught now is not necessarily wrong, but it's going to change. And you have to remain aware of that and you have to think outside of the square. Um, I have a, a friend who's actually a politician. He's not a scientist. And he talks about a story that's applicable not just to science but to, to life. Where he talks about the scientist who's actually in his bedroom and he gets a new uh, telescope and he's extremely excited about this telescope. He's so excited about this telescope he sets it up in his bedroom and he spends the rest of his life looking at the ceiling. He never takes it outside. So you've really got to remember to go outside and see what's happening around you and not stay incredibly focused down in, on your particular part of the world. So that's a bit of a preamble. I think I can now go forward. I've been asked about um, how to write a manuscript. It seems a little, after Rinaldo's passionate story, a little bit boring, um, but it is part of what you do uh, as a clinician scientist, as a biomedical scientist. Um, and here's an even more boring term, and that's project management. Uh, you probably don't formally learn project management. It's the sort of thing business people and engineers learn. But effectively, as, as a, a clinician scientist or a scientist, what we do is uh, manage projects. So you've talked a bit about deciding what your, what your research project is going to be and what your question is going to be. You then have to plan exactly how you're going to answer that question. Uh, and you've really got to define your question based around what you know and what the field is telling you. Uh, and then have a think about how you're going to address that question uh, and how you think the project's going to unfold and then go about executing it. Uh, and having, as you're executing it, you need to evaluate where you, whether it's actually working. Uh, so monitoring your ongoing performance, seeing if you need to modify your plan uh, and then go back and execute again. And so this is a loop that goes on endlessly. And some would say in a laboratory on a daily basis with going, I really shouldn't have done it that way. I'm really going to have to change this and go back again. You can't keep doing this loop forever, of course, because you'll never produce anything. And that's a point of research. You do actually have to complete this and come to a conclusion. And you do also have to have a timeline, uh, because otherwise you'll just keep going around forever. So what is it that we do when we complete? Uh, if you're asking a research question, you hope that what you find is then going to either change clinical practice or claim change medical care or change our fundamental understanding of how biology works. Uh, so what does that look like? It can look like a policy. It can look like uh, a, a patent. Uh, it can look like a protocol that you hope is going to be delivered in care. And, and it can and probably will at some point look like a manuscript because uh, manuscripts are one way that we disseminate the outcomes of research. And I think that the point I'd like to make here is that the question, what manuscripts would this research generate, is a question that comes right at the beginning. You should be imagining what the outcome of your research is going to be from the very start. Uh, and you keep imagining that as you go around and around the loop, but you do need to imagine what the uh, outcome of your research is going to look like uh, as a manuscript. So uh, why write a manuscript? Why do we write manuscripts? 
Uh, scientific manuscripts are the common and acceptable way of disseminating information. Uh, and you might say, well, that's just to the other scientific community, but these are uh, the people that you are interacting with, and these are the people you're collaborating with, and these are the people that you want to uh, see uh, your outcome and results. What about to the public? Uh, there are many ways of providing information to the public. Manuscripts more and more now are uh, publicly available, generally and broadly available. Uh, you can do media interviews, you can do television interviews. Uh, generally, the media is not interested in what you're doing unless they can make a catastrophic story about it. Uh, and uh, they are almost uh, uniformly going to pervert what you say into something that may not be quite as accurate as you might want it to be. Uh, so there's still a very important point uh, of publishing it as a manuscript. Uh, how else can your results be made available or make a difference? Uh, there's lots and lots of electronic ways of getting information out there now, but the scientific uh, and uh, biomedical community and the scientific community of all sorts goes back and reads manuscripts. So it's important to publish. It's also a very uh, frequently used measure of productivity. So as a, a researcher, your productivity will be evaluated on your publications. That's unavoidable. Uh, and it's not just about whether you publish, uh, but what and where you publish. Uh, and this is constantly measured. Having lots of papers is not necessarily a measure of quality. So quantity is not always uh, the name of the game. So I'm um, actually, each of these slides has, uh, has one of the publications that has come out of my laboratory, just to show you one of my favorite parts of biomedical science, and that is how beautiful it is, is it really is um, tremendously beautiful and wonderful and exciting to work in, in cell and molecular biology. So uh, quality versus quantity. Uh, I wanted to talk a bit about this uh, because there are different metrics that are used here that you might not have come across. Some of you will have. Uh, measures of personal quality. Uh, if someone is looking at a, a, your CV and asking, is this person a good scientist, they will look at a number of things. And one of these is the number of citations. So what does this mean? Uh, the number of citations that, that, that you have is actually the number of times somebody else read your paper and was interested enough in it to cite it in their, in their work. So it's every time someone else cites your paper, that's a citation of your uh, publication. Uh, and so each article that you publish will have a total number of citations, and that changes with time. Anyone new cites it, it gets a new cite. Uh, and you as an author will have an overall number of citations, so the cumulative total of all the citations for all the things that you've written. And, and that's one way that you will be assessed. Have you got a good number of citations? Uh, there is a term that's frequently, more and more frequently used. It's actually a relatively recent um, way of looking at a person's quality. It's called the H index. Uh, after uh, this guy, Jorge Hirsch, in 2005, who decided that one way of measuring someone's quality was to actually look at the, an index, uh, which is uh, the papers the, the number of papers that have at least uh, H citations, so X papers with X citations. So if you have 50 manuscripts, maybe you've published 200 manuscripts. If you have 50, and at least 50 of those have 50 citations, uh, then your H index is 50. Uh, and so it's really a measure of saying, of the publications you've published, how many of them are being cited. It's a number. All of these things are metrics. Uh, and the other thing that is taken into account when people look at your uh, publications is your authorship position. And you might find this a bit strange, but people will look at whether you're the first person on the authorship list, uh, the last person on the authorship list, or somewhere, somewhere vaguely in the middle. Um, and that does make uh, a difference. Generally, the first person is the person who drove most of the work, uh, potentially did most of the work, and probably wrote most of the text. And so they are the driving person usually in a manuscript. Uh, and the senior person is uh, involved in the initial planning, background research, and frequently the supervision. Uh, and they are, in terms of seniority, as you move through your career, you want to be moving from first to senior author in your publications. Uh, and the journal um, uh, matters. So the journal in which your research is public, published is also an indicator of the quality of that research, and we'll come back to that a little bit. It does depend upon the journal's impact factor. That's a measure that they use of the visibility of that journal. So what is impact factor? Uh, it's the 
a quantitative measure of whether the journal that you're publishing in uh, is of high quality. Uh, and it's really a, a calculation of the average number of times articles from this journal published in the past two years have been cited. So it's really asking how many sites am I likely to get if my paper is published in this journal? And people will look at your, at your CV and say, well, they're publishing in Nature. Nature has an impact factor of uh, well over 30, so that's actually high. Uh, or they're publishing in the uh, Indian Journal of, of Ophthalmology, which probably doesn't have an impact factor. So they'll, they'll actually judge whether it's a high quality paper or a, uh, a local journal with low impact factor. So it's a proxy for relative importance. Uh, and the other uh, metric that is sometimes used, but it, it raises a point that I'd like to make, and that is the cited half-life. This is the median age of the, age of the articles that were cited uh, each year. When you write a paper and it's published, and sometimes the journal might take six months to get that published, and sometimes they'll put it online quickly, people have to read it, they have to think about it, they have to write something of their own, that might cite that, pa cite that paper, and then you'll get a cite for your paper. So if your article is published here, it'll take some time before anyone reads it and cites it. And then there'll probably be a peak of citations, and then it will become passe, or someone will find something more interesting, and people will stop reading that paper or citing that paper. And so every manuscript has a half-life, and some journals have longer half-lives. In other words, the papers that are published in those journals are cited for a longer period of time. It's not always correlated with impact factor, but frequently is. All right, so what does a manuscript look like? Uh, I asked uh, before who the audience was, but how many people here understand what a manuscript looked like? You've all read a manuscript? Everyone. OK. So you could pretty much describe most journal articles or uh, manuscripts as, as having a structure like this. So a title, an abstract, and this is the generally 200 to 250 word summary that you can get on PubMed very quickly that will give you a quick snapshot of what that uh, study did and what they concluded. It's going to have an introduction in which you've got to lay the scene to the, to the current state of knowledge when you started the research and then pose the question. Uh, so that the reader actually knows why you were doing what you were doing. Uh, you've got your methods, sometimes that's at the end, but the methods is the detailed description of what you actually did, including the statistics. Uh, the results, which is essentially the data that you generated in your research study, uh, and uh, the figures uh, will show you, uh, will reflect uh, the results. So you'll be referring to figures of data uh, from your results section. You'll come to a conclusion within, we'll have a discussion about what your results say and a conclusion. It's generally not a separate section, but it's part of your discussion. And uh, aside from the figures and tables, there'll be some references. So they, they're all pretty much uh, this type of structure. Uh, but they do vary enormously. Uh, and that, that variation varies with journal. Uh, and it also gener there, there are also different manuscript types so uh, you, you need to actually look at the journal you're intending to publish in and ask what types of publications does this journal uh, actually print? Uh, and a full article is the sort of thing we just described, a full research article, but some manuscripts have what we call short communications. This is essentially also a full research project, but it's very compressed in, in time, in word length and figure length. So. Uh, journals such as Nature and Cell, uh, not Cell, Nature and uh, Science have these much shorter short communications. That's a majority of their uh, feature articles are short communications. So you've got to pack all of your background results and conclusions uh, in a, a very truncated version of about 1,500 words. There's also review articles, and often these are invited. So uh, as you go through your career, you may get asked to review an area by a journal, and uh, then you'll actually be reviewing other people's literature and coming to, coming to a summary for the field. There are commentaries in, in the front of journals like news and, uh, like Nature. You'll see things called News and Views. These are commentaries where if, they, if the journal believes they've got a great paper there, they'll ask another author to actually write a commentary highlighting that piece of research. Uh, there's protocol and data set type uh, manuscripts. In certain journals, they will publish 
a, a manuscript about the development of a new protocol that doesn't necessarily ask a, a research question, but is saying, I've developed a way of analysing this particular type of data another way. Uh, and there's also letters to the editor, and these, these tend to be unsolicited comments about somebody else's. Um, it's not something I've ever done, and I don't know how strongly I'd suggest that you spend your life writing unsolicited comments about other people's research, particularly if you haven't done your own, so probably not a good plan. Um, so we're really going to focus on full articles, because full articles and, and research uh, short communications is what you really need to be uh, generating as a, as a cl uh, clinician scientist. Coming back to the types of journals again, we kind of broadly group them into the very high profile general journals, uh, which generally you wouldn't put them in that category unless they have an impact factor greater than 10. So you're looking at Cell, which is probably the most highly, uh, highest impact factor, most highly cited uh, journal, uh, Science, Nature, uh, Lancet, New England Journal, PNS is a bit borderline. These are all publishing. Uh, and I've put them together not just because of their impact factor, but these are publishing to broad audiences. So they're not just um, gastroenterologists or nephrologists or uh, physicists. They, these are extremely eclectic journals that are publishing to a wide community generally. Uh, and so quite often the style in which you need to write for these types of journals, particularly the, the uh, short communication journals like uh, Science and Nature is a completely different style of writing. Uh, if you read one of those manuscripts, you'll see it's very conversational. Uh, it's uh, very trimmed down. Uh, you have to be able to summarise what you've done for someone who's not an expert in your field and is not completely across all of the background literature in your field. The specialist journals, still really good journals, uh, often are impact factor higher than nine, but sometimes lower. And you, you'll see now that uh, these types of journals are the sort of journals that, that I also publish in, and they're biased around kidney, because that's what I work on, things like Kidney International, the Journal of the American Society for Nephrology. And then you get down to subspecialty journals that are, are lower impact, and then uh, the local society bulletins, minor journals, often not in, pe in PubMed. And I'd really uh, point this out, it's very important nowadays, uh, the whole concept of uh, whether it's in a high impact factor uh, journal matters much, much less. What absolutely matters is that people can find it. And if your work is not in a, manus in a journal that is uh, being visibly searchable via PubMed, you're going to be missed. Uh, it needs to be on PubMed. So if you are writing for a journal like this, particularly uh, uh, Science or Nature, frequently it's uh, short communication, so it's really a, a restricted number of words. The audience is wide, so you have to write with an understanding of who your audience is. You cannot assume uh, that they understand their background, and the format is very different. It has a minimal introduction. Uh, generally, you've got to fit pretty much everything into your abstract and then move straight into what you did. There's a very tight word and figure limits. The title is absolutely critical and you must get to the point very quickly. So this style of writing is much more like writing a, a, a newspaper article. When a journalist writes a newspaper article, they get to the point first and then they go back and give you some background and then conclude. And these journals, are, 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 these manuscripts are always written that way. You have to get to the point of what you found first and then uh, fill in the details. In contrast, uh, these types of journals uh, tend to be more the fairly conventional format. The format is longer. Uh, it's a full research article. The audience who's reading it is more likely to have uh, an understanding of the background of your field. You can go into uh, perhaps slightly more jargon and slightly more assumptions of, of knowledge. Uh, it'll have a longer abstract, a much bigger capacity to put information in introduction. So understand what the journal type is and therefore what the uh, article types are that you're writing for. Uh, and that comes into who is your audience. So everybody wants to get into the best journals. So how, how do I get uh, into the best journals? Um, I'd start off, uh, as pointed out in the last uh, talk, that you've really got to read a lot. You've got to know what you're, you're aiming for. And this takes time and it takes experience. You really must read your field to have any real idea of whether what you're contributing is, is going to be high impact or not is going to be uh, an important thing to publish. Uh, and one approach is actually to look for the ideal paper. 
uh, if you are reading a lot in really high quality journals, you might see something, it may not be working in the particular field you like, but you may see a paper that you feel has done an incredibly good job in terms of the way in which they have developed their, their plan or their uh, logic and uh, presented their data and the elements that they've got in their paper. You can use that as your ideal paper uh, around which you model uh, what you're going to build and you can keep coming back to it and say, well, I can see that this paper got in because they went this one step further or they added this one thing. I would really need to do that if I wanted to get up into the highest impact journal. So find your ideal paper and that does require you to read a lot and to learn how to look at what you read and uh, in a sceptical way uh, and actually begin to judge yourself whether you think what they're telling you is, is solid uh, and believable. You do have to ask a challenging question. You essentially do not get into the best journals by doing the same thing as someone else and incre incrementally improving. That is not the way you get the highest impact journals. Uh, and uh, so you've really always got to be asking in your field, whether you're in intensive care or in nephrology or in uh, respiratory or in physiotherapy or whatever it is, uh, what's going to make a difference? And as clinicians, you're ideally placed to do this because you're actually working with the clinician, with the patients, and you're actually working in your specialty area, and you should be able to say, what would make a difference here? What is the main problem that my patients are facing? What will make a difference? Um, I would also agree that uh, it is very difficult to shift the paradigm uh, from very uh, strongly felt beliefs uh, but paradigm busting is really what you've got to be about. And the other thing I didn't put up here, but it was, uh, it, it was pointed out to me again in the last talk, is that the stuff that really gets into the best journals is the stuff that uh, changes beliefs, uh, changes an evidence base. It's the paradigm busting stuff. Okay, there's a lot of other things. You really have to understand your hypothesis. We, this is a very kind of scientific term. You need to know what you think uh, it might be the answer to your question. That's your hypothesis. I think that this might be the case. Uh, and so you've really got to understand that. You've got to un understand that in the context of all of the background information that's already been published. And that requires you to know the field. And to know the field, you need, to, you need the experience and, and the immersion in that research uh, to actually have enough time to actually know what all, all the uh, background story is. Um, if you want to get your stuff published in a high impact journal, understand that you've really got to do comprehensive, high quality work where you've got complete data supporting your hypothesis. You can't just stop and say, okay, well, that's good enough. I'm, I'm almost there. You need to write in a style appropriate to the audience and that changes with journal. And you need to be fastidious about your presentation quality. You really have to be careful about presenting the best uh, quality work that you can when you submit that paper. Never overstate your findings. You will not convince a reviewer that uh, what you've got is great by overstating your findings. They actually will look at what you've got and say, uh, do I believe you or not? And have somebody else read what you've written and take advice. Read the instructions really carefully, and th these journals have uh, endless instructions to their authors. So what is the journal really interested in publishing? What style of article are they looking for? And this is an interesting one. Who's on the editorial board? If you can actually go and look who's on the editorial board of your journal, if you can't recognise any of those people, you don't think that it, you don't recognise them as being associated with your field in any way, you might think, well, perhaps that's actually not a journal that's going to be interested in what I'm doing. Uh, what manuscript formats will they accept? What are the components and structures and length? How often do they publish? Do they charge? And how long do they take to the review? These are subsidiary questions, but they can start to become important. Uh, you could find, find that you want to publish in a particular journal and find that they only put out six issues a year. You're going to find it uh, pretty slow to get your stuff into the public light that way. Uh, they often do charge, and sometimes they take quite a long time to review. These are subsidiary, though. If it's a journal you want to be in, you go ahead. OK, so where do I start? We've got all this that looks like a, a journal article, but how do I actually start writing it? Um, I'd suggest that actually the first thing you do is write, is, is prepare the figures in the table, because that's actually a great way of pulling together the data and saying, what actually have I got here? So that's where I would start. Uh, then you can write the methods. That's relatively easy because you should know that in detail because you've done the experimentation. 
then take those uh, figures and write your results, and the results should be referring to the figures as you go. Write your discussion next, because that gives you a way of actually reflecting on what you've actually found. Then, then your conclusion. Uh, and then go back and write your introduction. So you've essentially got what you have done, and then you're actually building back in an introduction so that when the reader reads it, they, you've actually now provided them enough background to understand what your edition has been. The last thing you write is the abstract. At least this is one view. I'm going to tell you another view in a minute. Uh, and then you need a, con a concise and dis descriptive title, some keywords, and then the acknowledgements. Uh, and the references is something you're collecting as you go, and it's the last thing you, you do before submitting. Um, I actually do probably do a slightly different version of this. Um, I actually think it's quite helpful to write the abstract at the beginning and even draft a title. And I'd even go as far as saying you could do that uh, right at the very beginning, even, even when you start planning the project, because you'll rewrite it multiple times. You'll write, rewrite it constantly as you find that your hypothesis was wrong uh, or that your data has actually given you a new hypothesis or you've changed direction in, in, this, in this cyclical planning process. You do need, once you've got to uh, uh, some outcomes, to agree on the conclusion because the conclusion affects your title uh, and it affects everything. You need to really clearly work out what your conclusion is and you do need to work out who your authors are. Research does not get done by one person. It will not be you that does this. It will be a group of people and you need to know who's in your team from the very beginning. The team may grow but you need to know who's contributing from the very beginning. Um, I'd be rewriting the abstract multiple times, right all the way through this process, and rewriting it again as the last thing you do, and reflecting again at the very end on whether the title you've got is the one that is the punchiest conclusion you can present for that study. And the other thing I would uh, remind you, at no matter what stage of your career, is that you have to edit and edit and edit and edit. And that's not just you, it's everybody. And if you do not go out and reread it and reread it and reread it, have someone else reread it and have a colleague reread it and give you advice, and, and if you do not accept that advice, you will not produce the best product that you could have produced. Um, a couple of things that are very dry. Who gets to be an author? There are actually clear guidelines that constitutes authorship. An author is defined as someone who contributed to the planning of the research, uh, the execution of the research, its analysis, interpretation of the data, and or the compilation of the manuscript. And if you cannot answer the question, uh, what did I do as an author, and have it fit into one of these three, then you're not an author. And that's the way you need to actually accept. Being the clinician of the patient in a study does not represent authorship. Make that very clear to this audience. And there are guidelines around this. Uh, and a comment on research uh, integrity and research ethics. Uh, there are very clear guidelines on uh, what's appropriate in research and uh, research integrity, which you can actually go and check online. And there is a code that does provide a framework for managing with breaches of research uh, ethics. I'll just list some of these, research misconduct, uh, the appropriate management of, of research data and materials, appropriate publishing and dissemination of research findings, and uh, a proper attribution of authorship, uh, appropriate peer review and management of conflicts of interest. So you, you really are in deep territory if you start uh, um, deviating from this. And just a comment on ethics. Uh, there are clear guidelines and ethical frameworks, uh, both for the conduct, and conduct of human research and animal research. So how do I get my key publications? Know what your supervisor has published and is publishing. If you don't know that, you really are in the dark. And ask if there's an opportunity to publish your literature, uh, your literature review as a review article. So if you're a, an honest student or a, a, a clinician doing a period of research that requires writing of a thesis, uh, you will do a lit review. And these can be published. And if I look back um, early in my career, I actually uh, was a first author on Nature News and Views uh, why? Because it was actually contributed to by the stuff that I'd, I was reviewing and my, um, my supervisor allowed me to be involved in that process. Uh, similarly, this is an invited review uh, that's been cited many times that was really, that's really come out of just writing a lit review. Consider what aspects of your research project will be published and what your authorship role will be. You do want to be a first author. Uh, and plan your project. Within that plan, ask yourself, what is it going to look like when, it, when it's published? And you need to have these discussions up front and very openly. 
Right, now how am I going for time? Am I very over? So I've been asked by Ingrid to also give you a bit of an idea of the sort of research that, that I do and the sorts of ways uh, in which this has come together. And so uh, this is some of the research that's come out of my lab. And I, I want to focus on one particular set of work um, based on these images here, which is a paper that we published last year uh, in Nature. So my, I'm, a, I'm a developmental biologist, stem cell biologist, and um, this paper is called Kidney Organoids from Human IPS Cells Contain Multiple Lineages and Model Human Nephrogenesis. Essentially, this uh, project represents a culmination of seven years of work in my laboratory. Uh, so research outcomes do not necessarily come quickly. It involved collaborators all around the world. You can see there's quite a lot of authors here. Uh, it was a project that was incredibly risky from the very beginning, so we asked a very big question. Uh, and, and it was certainly, uh, it was not, what it was not the first, but will be the best. Oh, I see, I remember what I'm saying here. We, we actually showed in this paper, as you'll see in a minute, that you can actually take a stem cell and regrow a kidney. Uh, now, there have, been subsequent, uh, there have been subsequent papers to that, and there were early pa earlier papers than ours that suggested this might be possible. So we were not the first, but we will be the best, uh, because we, our protocol is actually, we took the time to do this very carefully and validate what we're doing, and that's very important. Uh, okay, so a little bit about uh, what I do. Uh, I work on the kidney, and most of you probably know that you have two kidneys. Most of you will have two kidneys, and you probably know that they produce urine on a daily basis. They actually do a lot of other things. They're really incredibly important. Uh, your kidneys actually regulate your blood pressure, your, your fluid balance, uh, your bone density, your red cell count. So there's really a lot of roles uh, that the kidney plays, not just filtering your blood and removing wastes. Uh, and the functional unit of the kidney is this uh, very convoluted and beautifully structured epithelial tube here called a nephron. You can see the vasculature comes in and there's a, a capillary bed here in what we call glomerulus. And this is where, under pressure, the blood is filtered and the urinary filtrate passes down here. That's a proximal tubule through a loop of hemli, a distal tubule, and out through this plumbing, which is a collecting duct, which is eventually going to have your urine going down a ureter into the bladder and then out. So you have a million of these in each of your kidneys, and that's surrounded by a very complex vasculature and a lot of interstitial cells that hold it all together. It's a remarkable structure. It's probably the most cellularly diverse organ uh, in your body, uh, and you can't live without them. But that organ was actually formed during development uh, from, a, from a much smaller number of cell types. And these, uh, this blue branching structure, very beautiful branching structure here, is the plumbing. It's the collecting duct network of the kidney. And this actually forms uh, from a little bud that grows in and then branches and branches and branches until it makes this very um, beautiful tree uh, within the organ. That actually isn't the nephron. That's just the plumbing. And around uh, each of these, uh, tips as that branch comes in and branches and branches and branches to form the kidney as it's growing during embryogenesis is a, this cloud of cells we call the cap mesenchyme. Uh, strangely, I've shown it in green here, but in red here. So this, this kidney here is actually, rota the rotating one is actually the same age as the tree that I showed you just before. And so these cells out here that sit around in this cap, these are the cells that during development are a mesenchyme but they will become epithelium and form the nephrons. And so all of your million nephrons are actually formed from this stem cell population or nephron progenitor population in the kidney. We've spent 20 years looking at this in, in animals like the mouse. Uh, and here's the branch that comes in and starts to branch and branch and branch within this area of mesenchyme. Uh, and what you see is this uh, cap right out around each of the tips. That's that cap mesenchyme or nephron progenitor population. This tree doesn't branch unless this population exists because this population is instructing the tip to branch. Uh, and the branching tip keeps that cap alive. And it also helps instruct that cap so that gradually cells within the cap commit to becoming an epithelium here. And this little ball of cells is actually the birth of one nephron. Uh, and so every time you branch, you make more of these and you get more and more branches and you get more and more nephrons. And that's great. It's wonderful uh, that it, it works so efficiently. Uh, here again is a, a tip coming in. 
Uh, and here you can see in pink that cat mesenchyme marked by this gene here, 6 2. And here's a nephron that's just formed. And that goes on all the way through development in humans until about 38 weeks of gestation in mouse until birth. And then this population here of nephron progenitors is lost. Uh, it completely commits to forming nephrons. Uh, and there is no evidence in humans or any other mammal uh, that if you lose a nephron uh, as an adult, that there is any capacity to grow a new one. So having worked on this population, what it can do, how it gets there, what genes control that process, uh, the realisation that it's not there in the adult kidney uh, took us back to this question. So our research question was, can we recreate these cell types for renal regeneration? And we were focusing on this population here, and so we went in with a hypothesis that if we could recapitulate development in a dish, we would be able to get back to that population and that population would make nephrons. So how do you do this? Let's go backwards a step. Your kidneys is one organ, you have many organs. Uh, and if you follow back through embryology, uh, this is a little embryo going backwards, the kidney is, uh, is a mesodermal organ uh, and it arises from this uh, little green branch that grows out at the side and branches here. Uh, which is called the ureteric bud, and this orange mesenchyme. And they, in turn, come from this block of trunk mesoderm as the embryo elongates, called the intermediate mesoderm, which in turn is actually coming from a, a portion of the embryo very early on called the, the primitive streak, which is the point at which we start to make endoderm and mesoderm. So we can map all this back based on embryology, and we can say, well, obviously, if we had a stem cell in a dish, we would want it to go through all of those steps to make a kidney rather than a heart or a liver or a brain. And we can walk through this process and say, if I start with the inner cell mass of an embryo, which, which makes this pluripotency gene OCT4, if we wanted to make a kidney, we would need to make posterior primitive streak. We'd then need to make intermediate mesoderm, and we'd then need to make this metanephric mesenchyme and neuroteric epithelium. Uh, and so we did this using what we call induced pluripotent stem cells. And uh, this has really only been possible since 2007. Uh, when Shinya Yamanaka showed that you could actually take any adult cell, we've got a fibroblast here and we do do it with skin, but you can do it with any cell. And if you force the expression of key transcription factors, so key genes, you can actually take those cells backwards to what we call an induced pluripotent state. So a pluripotent cell uh, is equivalent to the inner cell mass of the embryo and has an ability to form any tissue. So we can go from a cell that is what we would have called 30 years ago terminally differentiated into skin and actually change its, uh, its genetic activity back into a state where it believes it's in an early embryo. Uh, and that's great because from an induced pluripotent cell we can draw these endless diagrams of which there's probably 10 billion published now that say, well, we'll just take the induced pluripotent stem cell and we'll turn it into whatever we like. In fact, this is actually very difficult. Um, However, we're getting better, better at it. And in the last couple of years, a number of amazing papers have come out. One in which uh, uh, Sasai in Japan actually showed that by growing these stout cells in a particular way in a dish, this is what we call an embryoid body, and giving it certain growth factors across time, what they could actually form was an optic cup. So this is essentially an eye growing in a dish that's the back of the retinal forming. Uh, and this is work from Madeleine Lancaster, where she actually grew uh, a patterning uh, brain organoid. So this is human cells turn into what looks like uh, a developing human brain. Uh, and we call these organoids. So what we're not doing is making one cell type in a dish. We're making essentially a little patterning structure. And that's not so surprising, because that's what the embryo does. Uh, and so what we wanted to do was do this for the kidney uh, and to Cut a long story very short, uh, over that seven years we developed a protocol where we could take uh, either embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent cells and essentially across a period of about three weeks we, we, we change the environment in the dish by changing the growth factors and also the way in which the cultures are grown and we walk it through the steps of, of development that we expect to see until we actually reach this day here where we get this structure we call a self-organising kidney. Uh, it's not going to play for me. This is actually 
looking through one of these organoids. So here's your yellow collecting duct branching, connecting up to the nephron epithelium here, and then all these balls are the forming glomeruli. And so we, what we got in a dish essentially was a little model of a developing human kidney. Uh, and it had nephrons in it. Those nephrons are starting to segment into the different segments of the nephron that you need for function. Uh, and it's actually starting to make glomeruli. Uh, and if you look at the whole structure, this is about five millimetres across, so it's, you can easily see it with the naked eye. Uh, all of these are glomeruli in purple, and all this radiating green stuff is actually the blood vessels. So when, what, we, while we, what we wanted was nephrons. We got nephrons with an associated vasculature starting to form, uh, perivascular cells that will surround the vasculature, uh, and uh, we also got interstitium, renally patterned interstitium. So in fact, these organs make uh, at least uh, eight or nine different cell types uh, in an arrangement that's very reminiscent of a developing human kidney, uh, and they pattern them and differentiate them and segment them in a very similar way to what would have happened in an embryo. So uh, we wanted to ask, do the cells within the organoid begin to show cellular function, so are they actually working? Uh, and what you're looking at here is where we've taken one of these organoids and these uh, tubular structures here are the forming proximal tubules. The proximal tubules are extremely sensitive to toxins, and so what we've given uh, the, the cultures is a cisplatin, which is a chemotherapeutic agent which does cause toxic injury to the kidney, and shown that these little green spots start to appear in those proximal tubules uh, in a dose-responsive way, which is a very specific response of proximal tubules to cisplatin injury. Uh, we could get a little overexcited about this, and so we wanted in a very unbiased way to say, are we sure that this is human fetal kidney? Uh, and so we actually took uh, these organoids and made uh, total RNA out of all of them to look at all of the genes that are expressed. So we're essentially asking what genes are expressed in this and does it look like human kidney? Uh, and we compared it to a data set with about 25 different human fetal tissues from either trimester one or trimester two and asked bioinformatically, what does a kidney organoid in a dish look like? Uh, and it looks like a trimester one human kidney, uh, which is pretty exciting to us. Uh, the second most similar tissue is trimester two human kidney. And so it's not a tongue or a gonad or a liver or a heart or a brain, it is actually a kidney. So uh, I guess what this paper showed is that you can take pluripotent stem cells, be they uh, embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells, and the first time, for the first time we could actually walk it through to this very complex self-organising kidney structure, has more than nine distinct cell types, has evidence of nephron patterning, it's got surrounding vasculature and stroma, it matches uh, human kidney, and it responds appropriately to nephrotoxins. Um, now, that, that was heralded as being a very exciting uh, breakthrough, and we're very pleased to see a pretty picture on, on the front of nature. Uh, but essentially, if you ask, what am I going to do with this as a clinician, at the moment, you're not going to do much, because uh, really, we actually just move from here to here. We showed how you can actually take an in induced stem cell, induced pluripotent stem cell, and start to make kidney tissue. Uh, if you actually then want to go and do disease modelling or drug screening or actually engineer a whole organ to replace uh, the kidney or use cells from these to go back into a patient, there's a huge amount of research that still needs to be done. Uh, but this was the breakthrough that actually is going to allow a lot of that to proceed. Very excitingly, uh, because you can use induced pluripotent stem cells, this means that we can make those stem cells from, from a patient. Uh, and we are actually making induced pluripotent stem cells from patients. Uh, and indeed, now uh, the use of gene editing technology is advancing so quickly that we can take a, a fibroblast from a patient who, in my case, uh, we're working on this at the moment, has a, a mutation in a gene that means that child is born with a, uh, a, a kidney defect that will put them into renal failure in the first few years of life. We can actually make a stem cell and use a CRISPR editing to fix that mutation uh, and then actually use cells from the patient themselves to model both a normal and a diseased kidney in a dish. In this way, we hope we can actually develop not just a better understanding of their disease, but potentially also new treatments that might be personalizable for that patient. We're also working with a company to work on uh, using these little, in, these little organoids in a dish 
no bigger than they are now to actually screen drugs to see if they're nephrotoxic uh, before we re re reach clinical trial. This has been a major problem for the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, and we're actually working on the biggies, which are certainly the ones that the clinicians and the patients want, and that is can you use this protocol and scale it up and uh, pattern it appropriately to actually bioengineer a replacement tissue or actually develop a cellular therapy for the treatment of chronic kidney disease. So I'm going to stop there. This is actually Minori Takasato, who is the postdoc in the lab who really drove this project. Uh, and as I said, it was a very uh, long project with a very ambitious uh, aim. Um, and I think the lessons learned uh, was that we worked from a point of strength. This breakthrough was actually something that rested on 20 years of research into understanding how the kidney normally develops. And without that background information, we couldn't have actually even started this project. Uh, you certainly do. Um, Know what you need to know what you want to achieve, and we essentially went in there saying we want to be able to make kidney out of stem cells. We aimed high. I don't think you could have aimed much higher. Um, know what you will, uh, you will make. Know what will make good into excellent, and this was a really key issue for us. We could have published at various points in time. Uh, we could have published at various points in time during that seven years and got poorer outcomes. We could have had intermediate manuscripts, we could have had intermediate outcomes, and that may have been great in terms of number of manuscript, but it would not have been good in terms of the quality of the outcome. Uh, so we really focused on getting to the end and publishing high quality work. Uh, you have to be prepared to work hard, and this was an incredibly difficult project where a lot of people worked very hard, uh, and the other is not to panic. Um, as long as you're solid and you keep working towards an outcome, uh, you'll succeed. And I'm going to finish there. Uh, I have many, many people who've worked with me over many, many years, and it's incredibly important to emphasise the fact that uh, you're only as good as the team around you. Uh, and I thank all of them for their contributions, and I'd really encourage you uh, to spread your wings and see what, what questions you want to ask and what, where you want to go in your research. Thank you.